Happy Saturday, everybody. We're back. We're back. We're back. I'm sports mental health empowerment coach and licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. Lauren D. Pitts. That is the top of my amazing co-host, Bald Head. We're not going to tell you about Savannah until, until, until a minute. We, we we're probably going to introduce her later, but we have a very, very, very special guest today. We are so hyped to see us with us. Look, folks, this is House Talk Free Game. Welcome back. Ronnie, I got to put the disclaimer out there. This is my post Trevor Noah. Laugh so hard. My sides hurt. My face hurt. My eye sockets hurt. Everything hurt. Only thing I didn't do was tinkle on myself. And that was like, I was holding on for dear life because that was, you know, that was, it was close. It mm -hmm. was close. He is a stone cold fool. So my voice is toe up because of like, when I say literally screaming, laughing at his dumb behind, screaming, laughing. But this is House Talk Free Game, folks. Welcome back. And good morning, everybody. Glad to everybody be back on this wonderful Saturday morning. Look, y'all, as you know, there are many student and professional athletes who have struggled with mental illnesses or who are currently still struggling with mental illnesses. We know that mental illnesses are a complex problem that can hinder our athletes' well-being on and off the field. So improving our physical, spiritual, environmental, and relational health are equally important in having a great mental health. Ronnie, that's so true. And, and that's why, folks, it's so important for parents, family members, coaches, and teammates, and really anybody that's invested <clears throat> in the successful trajectory of the scholar athlete or the professional athlete to understand both the mental health risk and benefits to ensure athletes have the greatest opportunity for success. And oh, by the way, enjoy participating in sports too, because, you know, having some fun would be sort of like a really cool thing. I'm just saying. And, that, and that's the whole point of, uh, of playing sports. And that's what it's all about here at pregame. We love to educate, empower, support, and positively influence the holistic performance of today's student and professional athletes, their family members, and those invested in their athletic, professional, and personal journeys. So look, folks, if you find yourself <clears throat> struggling to understand mental illness and you have compassion for those affected by it, then you're in the right place because every single solitary week here on pregame, we share powerful, you know, every week, uh, Savannah, I tell them it's raw, it is raw. Dr. Pitt's filter busted. I done rubbed off on Ronnie, his filter busted. The filters is all clogged, so we just throw them away. <clears throat> we give it raw. And the reason why we give it raw is because life is raw. And I, I don't think that we're doing anybody any good by, by you know, filtering it and sugarcoating. So we we give it raw because life is raw and it's life, sports and mental health information that's needed to help everybody make well-informed athletic, but more importantly, life transforming decisions. Here's something else. We want you to remember that we are also on Heritage Sports Radio Network. You can catch us every Saturday at the same time we compete against ourselves. It's like the craziest thing, like what the heck is going on? Um, we are right now on HSRN airing as we speak, but we're also on HSRN at 10 p.m. on Saturday nights and then again at 6 p.m. on Sunday evening. And this is what we want you to know about our amazing team at HSRN. HSRN is empowering the HBCU family's head, heart, and hands to deliver the impact that we all know. We all know that it can. So don't forget to catch the lineup of great shows that are on HSRN. We got some colleagues that are doing the darn thing. And we want you to show them some love too. Absolutely. And shout out to our HSRN family for, for providing us the support that we need each and every week. So look, y'all, if you want to be a part of our actual show and our virtual audience, please register via our Zoom, Zoom link that's available on all our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, or if you are a firm, former or court, court, current student athlete who wants to share their testimony or share what it's like to to have to manage your mental health symptoms as a student athlete or anything you want to share as a student athlete, please email us at htpregame at gmail.com because we want to hear from you. Y'all, we have a great, great show lined up for you today, and we have a very, very special guest that we're going to get into in a few minutes. So today's episode is about 
Oh no, where my screen go? Oh, body image and body dissatisfaction among student athletes. <clears throat> Healthy body image can lead to protection of one's health, proper nutrition, and having the healthiest body to participate in their sport. These positive factors can lead to stronger endurance, longer ability to practice and perform, as well as increased mental health factors. So we're also gonna be talking about some of the downsides and some of the hardships that student athletes have to go with body image and body positivity. Whereas, you know, in some sports, if you're not the right uh, height or the right size, you can't play that sport at a certain level. If you weigh too much or if you weigh too little, you are not able to do these certain sports. If you don't maintain your body's image for an entire season or even during the off season, you lose your chance of being a, a part of a national team or a professional team. So we're gonna be processing and, and divulging all of this throughout today's show among you, as well as giving you tips on how to, you know, have better, have a better self image as far as your body goes and also a better mental, mental health for your body as well. So we're gonna be talking about all those things during today's show as well as providing you our mental health tips of the week. And this is the last week of the regular season for college football, at least at the uh, HBCU level. So we're going to be going through all the games today, all the classic games that we have today, because we have a couple. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and get into our mental health tips of the week. So my mental health tips of the week in regards to the uh, topic we have today. So I have five nutritional myths that I want to kind of uh, talk with our uh, fellows about this morning that you might have heard on numerous occasions. Because, you know, as, as when we think of body image and body, uh, you know, dissatisfaction, you know, most times we always think about, you know, females and how they, you know, talk about, you know, body image and body dissatisfaction or body positivity and things like that. But men also go through the very same thing as well. Men are also in some way or shape or form, very hypervigilant or even sometimes insecure about what they look like or how they how they feel inside their own body. So anybody that you see on Instagram or social media can sit there and say they're a nutritional expert, that they're a workout expert. I can create your workout plan, bro. I can create your nutritional plan, yada, yada, yada. But anybody can sit there and tell you anything about how to take care of your body. But at the end of the day, it's you finding what works for you. What well, might work for me might not work for somebody else. So I want to go through a couple of quick myths about some things that we hear in the community about how to take care of your body and what you should really look for. So one of the biggest common myths that we hear in the male community as far as body images is this quote, if it fits your macros and not to go too deep into things, but in a nutshell, macronutrients are basically your proteins, your fats, and your carbs. Those are the three big staple uh, nutrients that our bodies need to have, you know, basic functioning, optimal functioning for athletes, whatever the case may be. So when we hear people say, if it hits your macros, it's all good. In so many words, so let's say, for example, let's say I, as a student athlete, eat 4,000 calories a day. Now, so for out of 4,000 calories, I might have to eat 250 grams of protein, 500 grams of carbs, and maybe 150 grams of fats. So in our community, especially, and this is especially in football, basketball, whatever the case may be, when you're an athlete and you have to put on weight or you have to, you know, lose weight, one of the first things you'll hear coaches say is like, look, as long as you meet these goals, I don't care what you eat, just get here. So I could go easily eat, you know, 10 McDoubles, you know, get, you know, three large fries from McDonald's, whatever the case may be, and hit my macros. But the real question is, is the food that I just ate, is that really the healthiest option I can eat to meet my macros? And if the answer is no, then you may need to tweak your meal some. You may need to find the right balance of having foods that may not be as healthy for you mixed with foods that are going to give your body what you need to go out there and perform at your sport at the highest level. One of the second ones is, is calories in and calories out. And what this basically means is that people are fixated on how many calories you're burning and how many calories you're intaking. And so while that is a great baseline for you to start getting focused on if you are on your weight loss journey or your weight gain journey, just focusing on your calories can also be a headache and also make you hyper-focused on the wrong thing. Yes, how much calories you take in and how many calories you burn are are especially important, especially if you're an athlete, student athlete, professional athlete, whatever the case may be. However, like I said, there are many other factors that go into just how many calories you burn and how many come out. So let's say, for example, let's say you're a swimmer, for example, and we actually know somebody on this show, I'm not going to name no names, but we know somebody on this show who is actually a very proficient swimmer. One might tell this proficient swimmer like, hey, you're going to burn a lot of calories in this pool. So I'm going to need you to kind of carve up today. Now they're like, okay, so if I eat an extra thousand calories of carbs, I need to burn this thousand calories. 
And oftentimes people get mixed up and like, if I eat this extra amount of calories, I need to find a way to burn this. Do not get focused all the time on the numbers. There are many factors that we may not be able to see that contribute to how many calories we take in and take out. So be mindful of that. Another one, high fat foods are bad. And so, you know, when we think about food, we, like I said, we have the three basic macro macronutrients. You have fats, proteins, and carbs. When we think of fats, we automatically think, oh, well, fat is bad for you. You know, why would you want to eat fat? It's just going to put fat on you. In all reality, yes, there are some foods that have fats in them that will make you fat in a sense, quote unquote, make you bigger, make you gain more weight. You know, I want to sound politically correct on the show today. So I'm going to make sure I use my nice words. I promise. All right. So gain weight, get bigger, whatever the case may be. But there are fat foods that are actually really, really good for you. Here's a couple examples. Avocados. Avocados are very high in saturated fats, but the saturated fats that they're high in are actually really good for your heart health, your brain health, your eye health, your joints and all that. Salmon is um, has uh, the omega-3 fatty acids, which are really good for, especially for athletes. If you have joint issues, if you have, you know, your knees are creaking, your elbows hurt, whatever the case may be, salmon is good for you. It's good for your eyes. Um, peanut butter. Peanut butter is really high in fat, but it's a good fat for you in moderation. All fats can be good within moderation. It depends on what your balance is and what your macronutrients are for you and your body alone. Juice is healthy. Now, when we think of juices, you know, there's been this craze over the last couple of years, you know, where everybody's juicing, taking all these juice diets and things like that. Be very, very mindful because juices can also be contain a lot, a lot of sugar. And what do we know, especially for our younger student athletes, our high school and elementary age student athletes? One thing we do know that is, let's say, for example, Gatorade is a very famous drink that is given to a whole bunch of student athletes. I think if you're a student athlete, if you haven't had Gatorade at least once in your life, mm, yeah, you probably we're gonna have to have a conversation. But Gatorade is loaded in sugar. And what do we know as student athletes that when your body consumes a lot of sugar in a short amount of time, that sugar robs you of your electrolytes, it robs you of your potassium, and it makes you dehydrate a lot faster. So you experience cramps, you experience fatigue, you experience, experience headaches, shortness of breath, all these things because your body is loaded up on sugar. So if you are going to drink juices, whether it's Gatorade, Powerade, body armors, whatever the case may be, make sure you're being very, very mindful of the sugar content, the carb content, and all that, because it can have an impact on your mental health and your performance on the field. Um, and last but not least, eating healthy is expensive. And this is probably, especially for you know college student athletes, this is probably one of the biggest things that we always hear. And for me personally, like, you know, when I went to Virginia State, our dining hall and, and no sort of the imagination was elaborate. You know, we didn't have two dining, well, we did have two dining halls on campus, but they serve both the same things. Um, but we didn't have a lot of elaborate food options on campus. You know, you had your basic foods, you had your basic junk foods and all that. I kid you not, when I was living on campus, I probably made, I probably had more waffles for dinner than I've had for breakfast in my life. I kid you not. But that was because, you know, a lot of our food options back then weren't appealing or they weren't, you know, they weren't satisfying. So you always hear people say, well, if I want to maintain my uh, athletic performance, eating healthy is expensive. No, it's not. It's not at all. If you if you really if you really work at budgeting your money for a grocery list and things like that, you can find a lot of the key things you need to help your athletic performance relatively under fifty dollars a week. You can get you pasta. You can get you some protein drinks. You can get you some um, some protein bars. All these things that you can have in your dorm room, have on you, having your gym bag, having your book bag while you're walking to class, all these inexpensive options that you can use to help benefit you to make sure you're maintaining your athletic performance. So don't let somebody, now mind you, there are stores like Wegmans, Trader Joe's, um, Whole Foods and all that, that can be quite expensive. And yes, that is true. That, and especially, you know, in the underserving areas, you know, in the low income areas, having access to, you know, higher quality and new, more nutrient dense food might be harder to find. However, I would say that if you are able to get to an area where you can go to a grocery store that has better nutrient options, better, higher quality, dense foods, definitely make that trip. It might cost a little bit more in gas. It might cost a little bit more on your grocery bill, but you can make it work and it's not, it's not pocket breaking. So those are my mental health tips of the week. Um, Dr. Pitts, what you got? I'm going to piggyback on that. Um, 
but I just realized something when you sit six degrees of separation. I don't know why I never thought about it until now. When you were talking about the dining experience on Virginia State's campus, when you were there, which I mean, you you've been gone now what? Seven six years. years. No, six years. Six years. Seven, yep. years. Six, seven years. Do you recall if Thompson Hospitality was okay? It's so, still there. Okay, so for folks who don't know, let me go ahead and plug my 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 former company. Um, Thompson Hospitality is black owned and operated out of Herndon, Virginia. Um, it is an amazing, amazing, amazing food service organization that has, you know, a lot of the contracts at HBCUs all over the country. But originally that food service contract at um, Virginia State was held by Sodexo Marriott which is Marriott's food service um, division for college campuses. We did a hostile takeover. <laughs> and, and I will, and I will say like, so I, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to bat, I don't want to bash Tom because they, they are still in Virginia state and I don't want to bash yeah. them at all and make them feel like, you know, their food isn't good. I, but mm -hmm. I will, but I would, I would be lying if I was not honest with our folks because me and you had this conversation last week in regards to um, what's mm -hmm. going on over at Howard University. Yeah. And I said, by God, if, if social media had the influence it has now yeah. 10 years ago, yeah. oh, what? Student loans wouldn't even be a question of what? I would have had my doctorate paid for at this <laughs> point. Like, because, but I will say this like though, I kid you not, like no, no knock on the food. When when I did eat the food, the food was good. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. like as far as the variety of options, you mm -hmm. know, because <clears throat> not not to get too far off topic, but we know that at you know schools like D2 schools, especially black mm -hmm. schools, you know, af af athletics is not the hyper focus of the school. Mm -hmm. The school is mm -hmm. more hyper focused on what is the best overall product for the student basis, not necessarily right. what's going to be best for the athletes and then right. what's going to be best for the students. So we got grouped in with the students. So it was not like we had our own specific dining hall, our own specific, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. meals and things like that. Mm -hmm. We ate what everybody else on campus ate. Now mm -hmm. I will say this though. I will say this. My last year when we played, uh, we made it to the mm -hmm. playoffs. Thompson, Hop the Thompson hospitality uh, people through us a special Thanksgiving dinner before we left to go to Pennsylvania mm -hmm. for our playoff game. And I must mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. it was one of the best Thanksgiving plates to this day that I've had in my life. They put their foot in that food. See, that's what I'm talking about. See, they, they save that food for the special people that come mm -hmm. to campus, like them, them donors mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We got a little taste of that food and it was mm -hmm. amazing. Whoever mm -hmm. made them yams back in 2014, mm -hmm. please send me a plate this year for Thanksgiving because they were amazing. Okay. So let me put it out there like this. I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead. Cause you know, you talk about networking and net connecting and masterminds. So I'm going to say this to the folks at Thompson Hospitality, Warren and Maurice, you have scholar athletes all over the country that would really love and appreciate if there could be some consideration given to the special dietary needs of scholar athletes that are doing their level best to take proper care of themselves within the context of the demands that the sport puts on their body. So Thompson Hospitality may want to give consideration to having that discussion around the table if they're not already having that discussion. I say to my folks at Sodexo Marriott, um, have the, the same conversation. Now we do know that they're in competition, but the reality of it is, is there's great folks on both teams and both teams took excellent, excellent care of me when I was working for Marriott. And then when I eventually left Marriott and went over to Thompson Hospitality. So I think what I'm saying as someone who spent the first three quarters of my career in food service, in dining service on college campuses, there's on a serious tip, there is a great opportunity for discussion around the dietary needs of scholar athletes that certainly, and, and let me not forget the Compass Group because they're a big one as well, um, to consider having a particular discussion around their tables as it relates to the dietary needs of scholar athletes. However, that might need to be incorporated into the dining service contract. Now, as far as my mental health tip of the week goes, 
I think that it's really important to look at this systemically. And when we look at it systemically, we're not only looking at it within the context of coaches and trainers, but we're also looking at this issue around um, body satisfaction and you know body image within the context of the entire system. So parents and siblings and significant others, all of these individuals are responsible to stop putting so much emphasis on weight. Athletes understand what they have to do as far as, as Ronnie said, you know, how heavy they have to be or how light they have to be as far as managing that. But it's really important for us systemically to de-emphasize weight so that that can relieve some of the pressure that would lead into some of these unhealthy relationships with one's body and with food. Be aware of how you're communicating to the athlete about weight and performance. Focus on ways for athletes to enhance their performance and within the context of mental and emotional skills and not just body image. You also want to keep an open dialogue with the athletes about the importance of nutrition and staying injury free for optimal athletic performance. We are a system. We have these ecosystems, the people, places, and things that have the ability to influence how athletes are thinking and feeling and functioning and navigating their sport. But it's imperative that they also be able to properly navigate their mental health in order to optimize performance. And isn't that what the coaches and the trainers and the athletic directors and the athletic departments and the boosters want? You want optimal performance. You cannot have optimal performance if you don't have a systemic approach and look at the overarching contribution that everybody has the ability to make to the athlete's uh, mindset when it comes to body image and body satisfaction. We have to de-emphasize weight so that we can do our part in making sure that we're building these athletes up and not tearing them down. We all have a responsibility to do that so that we can help them to be healthy in every aspect of their life. That's all I got, Ronnie. <clears throat> and and thank you for thank you for that, Dr. Pitt. So before we get started onto our topic, we want to go through um, some of the uh, HBCU games this week. So where is my calendar? Here we go. Oh no. You want me to do the classics first while you're looking at that? Yeah, go ahead and do the classics first. Okay. Okay, so today is uh, November the 6th. We have Johnson C. Smith versus Livingstone. That's actually being played in Charlotte at the Irwin Belt Complex. That's at one o'clock East Coast time. Um, that's the commemorative classic. We also have St. Augustine's versus Shaw. Um, that's being mm. played in Raleigh, North Carolina at the George Williams Athletic Complex, also at one o'clock. That's the Raleigh Classic slash Military Appreciation Day slash Senior Day. Then we have Albany State versus Fort Valley State. That's being played in Columbus, Georgia at the A.J. McClung Memorial Stadium. That's at two o'clock East Coast time. And that is the Fountain City Classic. And that one is actually being televised on ESPN+. Plus. And then so <clears throat> my uh, fellow Trojans of uh, Virginia State University, they play their final regular season game of today against our arch rivals in the Gold Bowl, even though it's the unofficial classic game. It is a classic game for HBCU heads. The Gold Bowl is today between Virginia Union University and Virginia State University. So I'm rooting for our Trojans to finish their season off with a high note. Um, there's been a lot of ups and downs this season, a lot of unfortunate things that happened during the season, especially at the very beginning, um, surrounding COVID and things like that. So, but they made it through the season with no major injuries. Um, so a lot of learning lessons this season. So hopefully they can end today with a win. Um, and I do want to do a quick shout out to, um, another CIAA, um, team, Bowie State University. They are playing their, uh, senior day game against Elizabeth City State, but well, shout out to Bowie for already locking up a, a trip to the CIAA championship game next week. Um, they will be playing uh, Fayetteville State University for the uh, CIAA championship down in Salem, Virginia next week. 
Um, and actually, Bowie State is in the top 10 in the country for Division II. I think they're ranked number six or seven in the country. So, and they are undefeated in Division II play this year. So, shout out to uh, Bowie State. Um, we also have, uh, let's see, let's see. We also have Jackson State is taking on Texas Southern today at Jackson, Mississippi. Um, we have Shawan taking on Lincoln. We have Hampton taking on Gardner Webb. We have um, we also have Southern versus Florida A and M for the Pure Gold Day um, down in uh, Louisiana. Then we have last but not least we have Central versus Norfolk State for Central's homecoming game today. So shout out to all those teams playing today. Um, finish the season strong for those who are final game is today and get ready for the off season. Let's do it all over again. So now that we got the HBCUs out of the way, let's go ahead and get into this topic because I am super excited about this topic and I am super, super excited that we have a very, very special guest, guest with us today, um, Miss Savannah Del Razio. And did I say your last name correctly? Yes, Del Razio. Mm -hmm. Del Razio, okay, Del Razio. So Savannah is a scientist, educator, and entrepreneur who is currently founding a company that is called Casa de la Luna. And I will let Savannah go into more detail about her new venture and her new business. Savannah is originally from the Bronx, New York, born and raised until her uh, high school years where she moved to Florida for two years and graduated from Miami Palmetto Senior High School in 2014 with the Gates Millennial Scholarship. Um, Savannah, real quick before I continue to your bio, for those who are not familiar with this because I'm not familiar with this, but I want to say, Dr. Pitts, I think you've made mention of this scholarship before. Can you tell our listeners what the Gates Millennium Scholarship is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Gates Millennium Scholarship was uh, run through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They sponsored uh, 1,000 seniors for 20 years, so they've got 20 cohorts. Uh, the formal program ended, I believe, in 2018, um, and then they've done a continuation of it. So if students are hearing this that want to apply. It's an amazing, amazing scholarship. Um, it actually supports students for 10 years of their education in, in post-secondary. So um, you are granted four years, well, up to five years of undergrad. And um, that includes study abroad at your respective institutions. And um, that's everything, room, board, meals, like they give you the full package. And then um, if you want to continue your studies, they also support you through one master's and one PhD. And um, there are some, like, of course, uh, parameters around it. They have um, specific areas of study if you want to continue your studies past uh, undergraduate. But, um, it, you know, it's in five areas and you just kind of uh, apply for approval and, and check in there. And then um, you have to do that, those studies within, within 10 years. But it, it's an amazing, amazing program. And it's for um, underrepresented youth. So um, for students of color who um, are considered what we used to call Pell Grant eligible. So if your family falls under the poverty line, generally speaking. Um, so I qualified under that as a high school senior. And um, they basically take a, a really mixed cohort from across the, the U.S. So that's that's the gist of the program you think you think bill and melinda uh will retroactive a scholarship I, so it's crazy <laughs> because i actually graduated high school 10 years ago so technically yeah. i'm still within the 10-year limit <laughs> of getting that retroactive so um do you have bill or melinda's personal number email I that you, wish. Put, you just put a word in for your boy um because that would when be I greatly it, appreciated <laughs> okay okay so <laughs> So Savannah, after graduating high school, went on to uh, Occidental College in Los Angeles, California, where she participated in D3 women's water polo. She was also part of the school student government and also a part of uh, numerous multicultural clubs. Savannah was fortunate to study abroad on a small island called Bon Air, which is located in the Dutch Caribbean, which neighbors Curacao and Aruba. Dr. Pitts, this is a sign. I told you, you just need to go and go to Aruba. Signs happen. There's your sign. Um, while she was uh, doing her internship, she had the uh, privilege to receive four scuba diving certifications. And as well um, as uh, once she re uh, returned, she also was able to do two internships, one as a marine research field technician and another one as an urban and environmental policy nutrition educator. 
Upon graduating with her uh, bachelor's of arts in biology, she moved back to New York City and uh, enrolled into a graduate program uh, centered around education policy and public politics with a specialization in data analysis and research methods at the Columbia University Teacher College. Since graduating, Savannah has been supporting local entrepreneurs in the tri-state area by providing business counseling services. Most recently, she incorporated a startup and is currently seeking investments that will enable her team to launch their business in her spare time. She trains for triathlons, cooks intricate meals, and enjoys walks in the nature. Savannah, what are these intricate meals that you be cooking up? I, when I saw intricate, I was like, I must ask what intricate meals are. Yeah, yeah, let's start there for sure. I actually do this, um, like a real check in every week on Instagram on my social media. And the first thing I start with every single week is what my favorite meal was, because food is so important to me. I love food. I've been cooking my whole life. My mom, my mom doesn't really love to cook. She's a great cook mm. when she does. But growing up when we were, I don't know, when I was probably like 12, she was like, all right, like, you got it, you can do it. So we, we had a lot of autonomy in the kitchen. So I love to cook. And I love to cook from all different meal types. So Growing up in New York City, I had exposure to so many different rich cultures. Everything. And so I'll like, I'll get in the kitchen. Sometimes I've learned, like I've learned Vietnamese meals. I've learned Indian meal. I, I'll do anything. But what I really like is when I host um, and my, my boyfriend absolutely loves to eat. And so it's very helpful right now because he'll eat anything. And he's like, all right, well, how are we going to set up? So we'll do an appetizer. We'll do a main course. We'll do a drink, a dessert, everything. So um if you all make it out to New York or if I'm in the area, I'm happy to cook for you, but we cook everything under the sun. This morning, we just went to the farmer's market. So we pick up our, like our favorite ingredients. Um, they've, they've got uh, one locally that, that we like to frequent. So intricate meals run the gamut. <laughs> There's all mm. kinds of stuff. We, I love, love to cook. If you, if you, if you were doing a investment dinner, like let's say you were hosting yeah. a dinner for an investment <laughs> opportunity for people to invest and Casa mm -hmm. de la Luna, what is your go-to meal? What is the meal that you are putting on the plate? Appetizer, main, mm. and dessert. What you putting down on the table? Okay, this is a great question. So I would, so I'm Puerto Rican and Italian from the Bronx, like you mentioned. Uh, okay. So I would, pro I would honestly probably go with something Italian for this meal, just because like mm. we're big on around eating at the table together. Uh, food is really important culturally. I mean, for a lot of cultures, of course, food is like a cornerstone, just like dance and music. We know this, but um, for an investor meal specifically, I would definitely get a really good antipasta. So I'd have like either some prosciutto rolls and a good cheese with mm. an awesome bread. Um, and I know which bakery I'd pick, pick up from. <laughs> like I, I know. Um, I've been going there for a really long time in the Bronx. Um, and I would probably make a chicken scarpariello. So that's got like, um, it's like chicken and then hot Italian sausage and a mild Italian sausage. I'm like, I'm going to make people hungry while you're listening to this. <laughs> and it's got What's like a white wine and it's just, spicy. Just, just yeah. <laughs> and um, I'd make a big salad after probably mainly cucumbers and tomatoes. We eat salad typically after the meal to kind of help process. So thinking about our, our nutrition tips and things that we were just talking about too, that's important, understanding kind of how food goes into your body, how it makes you feel, um, what it's actually doing for you practically. Um, and I would probably end with, ooh, I would probably make, if it's like an afternoon thing, I'd make an alpha goddess. I'd do a, an espresso with a little scoop of ice cream in it and maybe a brownie. So that would be like the whole meal. Yeah, that, that's what would be, be my go-to. Just yeah. just let me know when the investment dinner is. I'm pulling okay. up. I'll make that six okay. hour drive. Me and my wife will pull up. <laughs> I'd love that. I'd love that. Seriously. Yeah. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fill out a check. I ain't even gonna put the amount. You just put whatever <laughs> amount you need for that meal. Just, <laughs> but that sound that sounds amazing. That sound so those who are out there listening, um, look, <laughs> your investment is gonna go in a very good place, and your stomach is also gonna thank you. Your stomach will tell you because our gut health relates to our mental health. Your gut Absolutely. health will tell your mental health, mental, your gut is happy. So happy gut, happy brain. There you go. So, and so Savannah, tell us a little bit about your athletic career. Tell us about what got yeah. you in water polo. Because um, where I'm from in Virginia, water polo mm -hmm. is like a very specific sport that only a specific handful of schools 
do. And I know in high school, we didn't have not no water polo, no swimming, nothing. Actually, swimming just became a, a consistent sport in Virginia for high schools. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But tell us kind of how what got you into water polo. Absolutely. I so one, I just want to say that th thank you for the lovely introduction, even just to this podcast at all this morning. It brought up so much for me. So many like memories came flooding in about my early athletic career. And, and I guess I'll take this time to just kind of talk a little bit about my trajectory as an athlete. It started very early. Um, so again, like I mentioned, I'm from the Bronx and, and again, and, and just like a quick note, my, my bio is, it's just to like, really, it was giving some information that, um, I think always connects back to athletics. And so I also want to highlight that, that, that sports has been so, so important to my life. And even though I'm not a professional athlete by any means, it continues to be something that um, supports my health. And so my, um, we talk about like the seven pillars of health, right? And so, so for us, like we talk about nutritional, emotional, mental, physical, sexual, spiritual, and financial health. And I, like, as I talk to my path to water polo, I'm going to touch on all those things. And I hope we keep talking about them because all of those are important um, and all definitely informed by, again, that, that trajectory. So I started out really early. My, my, my mother is a super athletic person. Uh, she's one of these people, it, she's like annoyingly good at sports uh, sometimes, but she's like the type of person you can like, she'll see a racket for the first time you give it to her. And in like five minutes, she's like kicking your butt at it. Like she's awesome. I, my sisters and I were not blessed with the same ability, but my mom was very serious about us being in sports. So she pushed us to do dance, to do anything that we can kind of get access to. And again, so we were in the Bronx and um, the, the Bronx has, uh, I mean, obviously, it's a very low income community in various areas. There, there are great parts of the Bronx, and then there are really tough parts of the Bronx, right? So I've grown up in, in any and all of them. But we, we enrolled um, at a Boys and Girls Club, actually. So Boys and Girls Club of America, which, again, super formative for my early, early childhood. Um, I started at six years old at the Kip Bay Boys and Girls Club. And um, I was competing and playing with a swim team there and uh I, I swam for a very long time we actually followed a coach to another uh clubhouse um and I was swimming at the Joel E. Smilo uh clubhouse and that one's like by Cretona Park East for those who are familiar with the Bronx um so I grew up grew up going there for a very very long time I would practice all the time I loved to swim um again just to talk because this goes into my business my entrepreneurship like I um I was obviously like a girl growing up on the swim team and I saw how girls like either dropped in or, or took on sports at different at various points in their lives. So again, that changed throughout, throughout my trajectory. I continued swimming. Um, it was great for me. My family had uh, some financial complications and my mom just needed to get out of New York and uh, sought some warmer weather in Florida. So my sisters and I all went down with her for what was my sophomore year in high school. So of course I wanted to continue sports. We were in Florida. I, um, I started, uh, I was swimming there and then that's the first time I was on a water polo team. And at the same time, again, using my background in swimming, I got a lifeguard certification and I started actually teaching. And that was my first solo entrepreneurial endeavor. And I actually thought, I wish I had a copy of like my first business card because it's so cute. It's like little, I printed it on like regular paper and cut them out like um, very cool. And, and I was, I started teaching swimming lessons and I would like hop the fence to get into this like local pool and, um, would put up my fine because I wasn't supposed to be advertising and would kick it out on, on my way down. But, uh, I was charging $10 for 30 minutes at the time, which was like crazy if you think about it. And I was just hustling, teaching kids how to swim. And I loved it. So it was something, cause I said, you know, especially for people of color, we tend to either not know how to swim and, or have higher drowning rates. Right. So I said, okay, like, just something that's important to me and something I can make money with. So again, how athletics has influenced my life and, and was like the, the origin of my, my hustling days, right? So uh, I, I continued on, um, did water polo for the first time in high school. My family, uh, well, my, sis, my younger sister and I moved back to New York for my junior year of high school. So I kind of flip-flopped. Um, I continued my athletic career. Um, I was going both to my high school team swimming and then I was also doing club sports so I would do like a practice in the morning a practice in the evening and a practice on Saturday I loved sports I was swimming probably like almost four hours a day at some point like I was swimming a lot a lot I loved it 
Um, I suffered some athletic injuries and of course my body was changing as a woman and I felt like, oh gosh, like, I'm not really sure. Like I want to swim anymore. You know, it's like really vulnerable to be in a, in a bathing suit to like see how your, the team dynamics are changing. There were fewer and fewer girls. Um, so I, I did that year again, swimming was super formative for me and we moved back to Florida from what was my senior year. And, um, in that year I ended up not swimming on the swim team anymore and just pursuing water polo. And that was really fun for me. Like I was totally low skill level, um, didn't know too too much, but had a great coach. And it was just like a nice way to kind of like get to know the school and to continue, um, getting in the pool every day. Right. So, um, when I was, when it was time for me to go to college, I said, let me talk to the coach. And, um, I wouldn't say that I was like formally recruited. I was sort of a walk-on sort of recruited. I had conversations with the coach and they were, um, low on girls. And they also uh, knew I had swimming abilities. So I said, it's okay. Like just come with what you have and we're going to coach you through it. So it was a division three, uh, sport, but, uh, I, I, I would say that, um, Southern California water polo, even if it was D3 was pretty tough. <laughs> like these are amazing, strong women. Like I, it's just incredible, you know? Um, so I, I had the privilege of, of competing in the SIAC tournament, um, which was so cool. I had a great team, really enjoyed that. Um, and that, that's how I came, came to water polo actually. And I did that for a year and a half of college. And then I left the team, uh, afterwards, there was some like internal governance, um, issues at the, at the school for the, the coaching staff and they had a transition in staff and I didn't, I didn't, um, want to continue with the new coach that they hired. Um, and so I ended up just focusing my other time on other studies. And so again, like leading me back to kind of what you were saying in the beginning, uh, speaking about, uh, scuba diving and that, all of that, all of, all of the things that I experienced in practice were, were what enabled me to get these jobs later, to, um, get these certifications, to be in these programs because I had the fundamental skills. Right. And it was really important to me to be consistently teaching that. So that is my long winded answer to how I got to water polo, but I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, details in between to fill in specifically on the topic of body dysmorphia too. Savannah, wow. Just wow. <laughs> on so many different levels. What an amazing, amazing, amazing journey you've had. And as you were speaking, what was coming up for me, it reminded me of a number of different shows because you said something that was really, really powerful. One of the things that we're constantly emphasizing on this show is how important it is to, to have, like, obviously we know where your particular sport is concerned, it's important to have laser focused vision and to be dedicated to build your performance. But what you also demonstrated is the importance of using that skill set in a broader context that, that what you did was you were building up your sense of self in all of these different ways that was able to earn you money, that was able, able to keep you mentally well, that actually made you more marketable as an athlete. And we have put so much emphasis on that, that you don't have to live, breathe, and die just that one sport because those skills are transferable. And I just wanted to point that out that you just illustrated that perfectly. So thank you. <laughs> thank yeah. you for, for just like thank putting you. a bow on what me and Ronnie have been saying for the past two darn years. Like yeah. there's so much more that can be done with all of these amazing skills that you all are acquiring in whatever the, the primary sport is. So thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think about communication, discipline, listening, um, pushing yourself to limits, learning how to lose, like, right. All of these things are, are totally translatable life skills. And I like, I, yeah, I can't emphasize enough how important sports was for me and still is for me. And so in relation to our Thank topic you. today, because I, I would imagine, so when, when I think of swimming and, and I always tell people, the two heart, the two sports that you have to be in absolute ridiculous conditioning for is one swimming and one a boxing. I feel like the, in boxing MMA now because MMA is becoming more of a thing. So mixed martial arts. So I feel like for swimming, boxing and mixed martial arts, those are the two sports where your peak conditioning level has to be so much higher consistently because for people who don't realize like, yes, 
you know, when you're swimming, you know, it's kind of like a, a gravity effect where, you know, you're not feeling your entire body weight, but it is a full body workout. And so I, I always watch the water polo games during the uh, Olympic games and stuff. And I'm just like, man, how the hell do they stay on top of the water, swim as fast as they do, grab the ball and able to, you know, coordinate with their team is, is, is artwork in motion in a water. And it's, and it's such a beautiful thing to watch. But as far as, you know, for the, the athlete in their body and their mind and things like that, what was your journey like, you know, being in peak physical conditioning, eating right and things like that? Because, you know, I, I, I won't speak for you, but I know for me growing up, you know, nutrition, you know, of course, everybody talks about nutrition when you're, you know, playing sports and things like that. But nutrition for me, I never felt like it was really hyper focused until I got to college. You know, and even then it wasn't necessarily a hyper focused thing. You know, we talked about it. We were given suggestions and resources and things like that, but it was still kind of left up to yourself. So for you being, you know, a swimmer through high school and then doing water polo um, in college, what was that like maintaining, you know, just your peak physical conditioning on top of dieting and nutrition? Yeah, this is a great question because, I, you know, it overlaps. So thank you for the question, because it, it overlaps so much, especially with like our sociocultural um, like context, right? So I'm going to put a little bit of that in there, too. Uh, I would say the first when when you all introduced this and you were talking about Gatorade, that I got a flashback to my day, my very early days um, when I would get like a smell of the chlorine and I was like about to go to a game and they were handing me <laughs> goodness, um, lovingly, lovingly handing me a chocolate bar and the gigantic Gatorade, and I'm six or seven years old, right? Eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. And they'd be like, chug this before you compete. And it was like, for me, I'm like, okay, I got it. We would get eggs for breakfast every time. And it was just like that and go. So we go, I wouldn't eat anything on top. It's crazy, right? And so terrible nutrition decision, right? Yeah. <laughs> and again, again, like we were in the Bronx, like under, you know, I don't know how much like we were really informed at that time. And so I'm sure, I'm sure with good faith that that has changed since, right? But so that was what, you know, my mom was handing to me. And I, I think that's what I'm like, wow, like that was probably terrible for my cramp and all that. And I was a very young girl. And so so I, I would say this only because I my family had a beautiful transformation to eating whole nutrition, like a really um, like food with really good nutrition, right? So we, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna explain a little bit of that transformation, how that happened and what that was like doing it on food stamps, right? So. Um, my, my uh, two things. One is that my business right now deals with women and women's health, right? So mm -hmm. the, our arc of life really significantly changes. Our bodies change. I went through two puberties. I went through one when I was very young and around 10 years old. And that's my first stop, my period. And um, like, you know, my, my body grew, I changed. It was like so different. And again, I was already a swimmer at that point. I had been a swimmer for four years. Well, I, and I'd been swimming for a lot longer than that. I mean, I'd learned to swim at like when I was a baby, right? But I was on the swim team going to practice regularly at, at six or seven. So um, I had to like learn through that change. And so like my body was changing. I was slower, right? By the time I got to like 14 years old, I was peaking. And I said, oh my goodness, I was used to taking trophies and medals and winning and winning and winning all the time. And then all of a sudden I was like slower. Or I would like, I remember the first time I qualified out of, out of like the top seed and I was like looking around like oh my god I'm the fastest swimmer in the second seed right now like that's never happened to me and so it was it was both a mental shift an emotional shift um and so so to talk about nutrition because I'm going to go back there I'm kind of I'm kind of a little bit all over the place you're, I'll, you're I'll all good. Back, I promise. We're, we're used we're used to we're used okay. to talking about three or four okay. different things at one time but okay. they all tie together it comes back they full do. circle they totally do so so like my body was changing, not that, I mean, that's like super physical awareness, right? Like your whole, like you look different, you're buying different clothes. You're just, you know, like socially you're interacting with people differently. Um, so I had to like really, really, you know, my body has changed over time and it changed again in college. I, I grew my body, like all kinds of things. I gained 30 pounds in my first year of college and it wasn't even bad weight necessarily but mm -hmm. like again this is how my body is now and I have to understand that I'm never gonna go back to what I used to be like but my mental struggles through that are, are something that I would love to touch on so um circling back to to nutrition for a second um when I was young we didn't have a lot of information as we grew older my mom would like read or hear on the news information about like oh, okay like here's here's how you can change what you eat so 
you know, sometimes I would get, <laughs> get a Nutella sandwich. It's very Italian. It would be potato bread with Nutella in the middle for lunch at school. And that's terrible. Like I think about it and I'm like, oh my goodness, that should be like a dessert and maybe even half of that for a child of my age, right? But that's what I was getting just for lunch. Like that's what that would be, that would be what was packed for me, you know? And so my mom slowly started to change those things. And I remember when she first started introducing fish because remember I cook in the kitchen. And so I, I'm in the kitchen. I'm like, that's not chicken. I know that's not chicken. <laughs> and my sisters, and so, you know, and they'd try and trick us. Like, you know, yeah, it was, it was so funny. Like, uh, that's not ham. And they're like, oh no, that's ham. I'm like, that's not ham. That's turkey. Like I know that's turkey. So my aunt and my mom knew that I knew. So they'd just be like, Shh, we're not going to tell your cousins. We're not going to like, and so we just went along with it and we started slowly changing the diet that way. My mother um, is, it, she's not shy. She's a very strong, strong woman. And so she, she had so much audacity. She shamelessly, and I thank her so much for this because she showed a lot of like vulnerability and strength. She would take our food stamps to Trader Joe's out in Yonkers and we would drive out there from the Bronx and my mom would come up to the cashier and every single time without fail, they'd look confused. They wouldn't know if we took it. They'd call a manager over because, you know, that, that was the early 2000s and we'd be sitting there like patiently waiting to see if like they're going to take it and then they're going to figure it out. And so that's how we slowly started changing things. We went to from, you know, eating, um, eating things that I had described earlier to now having whole wheat bread, having fish, having grains. And um, so, so that changed. And so having that at home was really important for me. So I just was able to make better choices. And then of course, I, I was fortunate enough to go to a private school. So they were giving us great food there. And so sometimes I'd take that food home. Um, and, and so for me, like in my, in my trajectory, I learned to just eat better. And of course I love to cook. And so I said, okay, how can I be conscientious? Cause I'm the one who's shopping for myself. I'm the one who's like picking things up. Um, and, and um, yeah, I, I have again, learned a lot, mostly through school, I would say, and, and through like health education, um, especially in college. And I, I struggled a lot with like my body weight and with my like own image of like who I, you know, how I looked and, and who I was. Um, there's a certain vulnerability that is associated with swimming. I mean, you're in a bathing suit, like how much more naked can you be in front of people? You can't really hide too much in that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I had been in a bathing suit almost every single day for now, like 15 years. Right. And so there, there were, and I, and again, I, I had, we're a family of all women. I grew up with a single mom and, and three sisters. And so uh, I'm like the largest woman in my family, whatever that's supposed to mean. And um, my mother, she's very small framed and so are my sisters. I did not, I caught the Puerto Rican frame. So mm -hmm. I have like wider hips and wider shoulders and just like, um, it, you know, I have a very different body shape. And so for me growing up, I would always like compare myself to like what I was seeing. And um, th that, that was always impacted like how I felt and what I wanted. And I did go through a phase, especially in high school where I felt like, oh, I, I want to be skinnier. I don't want, I, I don't feel like I, I look the way I want to. Um, and uh, I'll go into it more, more later, I'm sure if we, if we follow up with it, but it, I think the most formative thing for me is I went to a, um, I went to a lecture one time at school for people experiencing body dysmorphia. And I said, like, I really, I just want to like learn about this because it's occupying my mind so much. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it, you know, I'm thinking about it as I go through the cafeteria and I eat a lot of sugar, right? So I was like, okay, I know that I love dessert. I had, would have a dessert every single day. So I'm like, okay, like, what about that? Like, why am I doing that? Like, what, what am I experiencing? And um, I remember the lecturer talking about, she said, you know what? Like your body is the, the only thing fighting to keep you alive every single day. You can think what you want about other people, about, who, you know, there, nothing is fighting as hard as your body to keep you alive. And that just, I like sat back and I said, oh my goodness, how could I treat the thing that is the only thing that's keeping me alive? so poorly. <laughs> so I said, I'm done with that. And I just shifted after that, totally shifted. Mm -hmm. And I stopped calorie counting. I stopped doing a lot of things. And I'm not saying that calorie counting is bad. I think sometimes if that's what your meal plan is and that's what you need as an athlete, totally important, you do it. But when it becomes something insidious or something that you're beating yourself up over or something that um, is lending itself to bad behavior, mm -hmm. right? Or something that doesn't feel good to mm -hmm. you, then that's when you need to pay more attention to it. And and, and from that moment, I, I totally shifted. And of course, like there are messages that we get from everywhere, from society, from our family, from our friends, from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, 
yeah, well, I will chat more about it, but I don't know if you've got to follow. No, up no, Savannah, Go you, you just nailed it because what I wanted to okay. highlight is the factors that contribute to a negative body image so that, you know, our viewing and listening audience understands that. And you just touched on a number of them. And the, the one that you didn't mention, which I think is, well, you alluded to it when you okay. talked about all the changes that your body is going through and being, you know, in a male dominated sport and what have you, it's being teased about appearance in childhood. You know, growing up in a household where emphasis is placed on appearance of a particular ideal body size or, or shape, genetics, you, like you nailed that, you know, as women of color, yes, there are some women of color that are stick thin and like, but that ain't most of our stories, okay? It, like the, the genetics is like your body for days, you're totally body for days. And how do you manage that and, and get to that place where knowledge really is power and really understanding how your relationship with food and how your relationship with your body is impacting your mental health? Well, a big part of that is education because you have to be able to really understand what factors are contributing to your negative body image. We didn't, get, and I don't even know, I'm, I'm thinking we'll sort of shy away today a little bit, but trauma, the, the traumas that can go on in your life that can give you a negative body image and, and make you feel ashamed of, of how you look, you know, um, his, you know, family history, that multi-generational transmission of morbid obesity and, you know, you, you nailed it again. You both touched on the fact that eating healthy can be expensive. Well, when you look at, you know, you look at the Bronx, you look like where I grew up from in, in Southern New Jersey, you know, right now, well, I haven't been home in, in over a year, but the last time that I was home, we didn't even have a grocery store in my mm -hmm. hometown. The nearest grocery store is a Save-A-Lot. And then the grocery store after that, we have a chain in the tri-state area called Acme Markets. But it's like Wegmans, Trader Joe's, where? You're, you're going an hour away. Mm -hmm. You're going an hour away to get to farmer's market, where? At home, we have Cowtown. People know all about Cowtown on the East Coast, right? And it's like, but not having those options. And I think that it's so important. I'm, I'm so appreciative that both of you mentioned that because what do we say clinically, Ronnie? You can not conquer something that you don't even know is a problem. You have to be able to know it. You have to have heightened awareness in order to be able to address this. You have to be able to acknowledge it, confront it, and then you're able to conquer it. But to your point, you, I can't speak for folks. It's been years and years and years and years and years and years and years since I had to, to receive food stamps, but I certainly have received food stamps before. But there's embarrassment, there's shame, yeah. the humiliation that comes with that being on mm -hmm. public assistance. So I think it's reasonable to say that your average you know, person that's receiving food stamps is not gonna be like, oh, let me take this hour drive. Mm -hmm. they, Wegmans, do they, do they even know? Yeah. I mean, let's, and I'm not saying that to be, so before I get hate mail, I'm not saying that to be disrespectful. Like, I'm wondering how many people in my hometown that is a very impoverished community, how many people know about Wegmans? How many people know about Trader Joe's? How many people know about all of the other healthy food chains that are there? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it's a lack of knowledge why people are perishing. I think, um, let me just real quick and, and then I'll shut up. I wanna give a shout out to my mom. Hopefully she's listening. Um, first and foremost, this is a Paulette original. Let me just go ahead and say that. She made this for me. Thank you, mommy. Um, but where food is concerned, my mom is one of 11 children and she grew up very humble beginnings where they, my grandfather you know, went to his regular job, but had gardens. Like I remember growing up, you know, riding on the back of a tractor where we grew our own vegetables and we raised our own cows and chickens and pigs and sent them to slaughter and, you know, making butter. And like the only thing that we got from the daggone grocery store back, back then was, I don't know, because we, we were, I think maybe milk, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
making butter, making cheese, the, all of the meats. But my mom to this day, if you go to my mom's house, she has little nitpicky stuff that might be canned goods from the grocery store. She is the fresh vegetable queen. You hear me? In my mom's, in the, the back part of the kitchen, she has this huge, huge, huge shelf that one of her friends made for her that is full of fresh canned vegetables. She makes her own spaghetti sauce. She makes her own, she makes her own freaking everything because her thing is I need to be able to eat healthy and all of that stuff that they're putting in the foods at the grocery store <clears throat> that, ha that has 10 year olds with bodies like mine and yours, Savannah. She was like, no, we're, we're not doing that. So she is, mom, what did you, oh, well, I, what'd you have for lunch? Well, I have these salmon and some Brussels sprouts. Mom, Brussels sprouts are disgusting. Well, oh, I had some beets and she, like she, to your point, teeny, teeny, teeny. She's not as teeny as she used to be, but growing up, my mom was like 98 pounds wet. I'm like, I could just push you down right now. Just a teeny thing, but it's because she literally ate healthy. Even though she grew up very humble, she grew up eating very, very healthy and she's still very health conscious today. So it can be done. To your point, Savannah, you, you gotta get innovative, but it can be done. It absolutely can be done. So I just want to highlight that from the hush now. Yeah. And so um, so Savannah, thank you for, for your sharing your um, history with food and and I, and I and it, so before I um, go into what I was gonna say, I wanted to ask you real quick um, before I talked about it from the I guess the quote unquote other side of the spectrum as far as like relationship with food, because I want to share with our listeners the perspective from somebody who was obese their entire life, because that was my story. Like I was always the biggest kid and I'll get into that in a second. But I wanted to ask you a quick question because you meant you highlighted, especially when you were in high school and you were more body conscious and things like that. How is that being a female student athlete? Because oftentimes when we when we think of female student athletes, you know, those who are in, you know, the uh, the high anaerobic sports of soccer, swimming, uh, track and field, cross country and things like that. And one of the things you always hear is like, you know, sometimes your puberty is stunted or it's not a full de developing puberty because of the uh, the aerobic strain and the athletic strain that, the, that women's bodies are put on at a very early age. So when you talked about, you know, going kind of going through two puberty moments, talk about that a little bit more as far as like the physical effects of it and then just the mental effects of like, being able to like, you know, work through the mental idea of like, you know, you're seeing your high school friends, you're seeing the community and things like that. And society is telling you as a high school teenager, female, like, you know, well, this is what you're supposed to look like. This is what you're supposed to be doing and things like that. So how is it managing that as a high school student athlete? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Absolutely. Uh, I'll give a little bit of um, contextual history of my own experience and then talk about kind of uh, what's informative for me. I would say, and, and also just like quickly, this topic of like body dysmorphia and even just like that conscientiousness has come up so regularly, even just this week for me. And that's why I love that we're even here talking about this today because I, one of my good friends, um, he was a college football player at my, at my school um, at Oxy. And he just made a po Instagram post like on Wednesday this week about body dysmorphia and I was like wow and then my boyfriend who's a physical education teacher comes and he said one of my one of my players keeps getting made fun of by these girls because he's got chicken legs and then a coach another coach made a comment about it and my boyfriend called him out and said hey you could, that's body shaming right and so there's these interesting like ways that this has come up this week right and um and now I'll give reflections on how uh it, it used to be at least while I was in high school, again, a lot of that is still true because it's like your sociocultural context and it depends where in the in the world you really are, right? Like there's all kinds of like different types of shaming, whether it's about, um, you know, like your weight or your stature, like all, you know, and we can, we can even talk about like sexual health, to be honest, right? Like there's body dysmorphia there too. And that's what my business is concerned with. So anyway, I'll, I'm going to start telling you a little bit to answer the question, but um, I, I just love how it's been coming up this week because it's, it's such, uh, it's such an important topic. So two puberties. Yeah. I 
again, my first puberty was when I was like 10, 10 to 13 ish, right? Like I, I had gotten my menstruation. Um, I was swimming and my mom said, I was like, I don't know about this whole competing when I'm, you know, during my time. And she was like, I'm, I'm, you got to figure it out because you're star player on this relay. This is like, swimming is, is one of those weird things where it's a little individual, but it's also a team sport, right? So like you're some, most of the time you're competing alone, but your points matter for your team. And then there's always relays, right? So um, I was swimming in particular types of events and um, with my body changes and my growth over time, I, I mentioned that I got slower, right? So, like I was, um, I reached almost like a, a plateau in my career and I felt like, oh my God, my time hasn't gotten faster in at this point, three months, four months, six months, like a year. And then I said, oh my goodness, I'm slower, right? Like I actually went through that where I said, I can do 25 yards. I used to be able to do it in like 16 seconds, 14 seconds, I would say. And then it was like, oh, now I'm at 17 seconds. What's up? <laughs> I'm like, hold on, am I heavier? Like, what? I'm like, I'm taller. I should be closer to the, to the other side, you know? Like, and it seems ridiculous, but that was really, really hard for me. It was really tough. And then of course, like my, my mother grew up in an era where uh, like being skinny and like having that like 90s, like very thin look was in fashion and style. And she wanted her girls to be perceived as beautiful and for us to like look a, a particular way, right? Um, so it was, whether that was how we dressed or like how we wore our hair, all kinds. Of, I mean, this, this happens, doesn't matter what culture you are, right? So um, I, like I, I was dealing with a lot of that at home, feeling like, okay, well, Maybe I don't look how I should look, um, you know, and, and I, I would say with in my sport, I always felt comfortable because it was like, I'm here to compete, like, what's up, <laughs> you know, like, that's kind of was my attitude around swimming, at least. Um, but then again, like the way I was perceived at school or like how I dressed was, was informed by like that either confidence or uh, lack thereof. Um, and I would say it fluctuated a lot. I, I started to restrict my eating um, when I was in high school, when I was in like the 10th grade. And that was, I think, like, just emotional uh and also uh, like mental health related so I um I went through a period in time where I was like oh I'm not gonna eat that or oh I shouldn't eat at a certain time you know like never eat after nine o'clock and like I had all these rules and um it, it was it was hard because there was nobody at home at least telling me like Savannah that doesn't make any sense so like that's not true right it was at school where people would kind of like talk about that, you know, a little bit more openly, whether it was a health class or something I saw on social media, you know, something like I was like either communicating with other people who were a little bit, um, you know, like trying, trying to create more positive mental health in the mainstream. So uh, when I was listening to and consuming that type of thing, um, I was able to like do self check-ins, which was super helpful. I started to journal. I started to do all these other like little shifts. And I, I went into like an extreme in college where I said, you know what, like, forget any of this. Like I'm going to eat at whatever time I'm hungry because the thing that knows is my body. And remember I had talked about that like particular podcast shift. I had um, a friend in college who sent me a podcast and he said, Savannah, you're fat phobic and you need to listen to it. And I'm like, that? what? And he, and he was like, listen to this podcast and you're going to understand. It's not, I'm not like, blaming you or bl like saying something particular about you as a person. I'm just saying that there, this is a phenomena that most people believe or feel they are fat phobic. Right. And he said, listen to this podcast, just give it a chance. And I'm like, kind of rolling my eyes. I'm like, whatever. It was a, an hour and 15 minutes, this podcast. So I said, you know what? One day I was on the train from New York, from, from upper Manhattan to, all the way to Brooklyn. And I said, I'm going to take this hour and a half long train ride to listen to this podcast. And I listened to it. And I'm so thankful I did because that podcast, told me that the world was made for smaller people and that when you walk into restaurants and when you go to places sometimes the chairs are tiny and they said just imagine for a second if your body is different and I think this beautifully segues maybe into like what you want to share so I'm going to stop talking very soon um but but that also really transformed the way I thought about bodies and moving to a neighborhood where there were more women who looked like me who leaned to the Puerto Rican side I'm in a predominantly Dominican neighborhood was so helpful for me for the first time in my life I was sitting at like tables eating with people or just like walking around and seeing women who are thicker, who had bigger upper bodies and bigger lower bodies, whose thighs were like the size of mine, right? Cause like, again, my mom and my sisters, they got skinny legs. Like, you know, like they, 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 I don't have that. And so 
so for me, it was, it was so informative and I had to do a real check-in about like, okay, how am I policing my own body? And like, what is real that I perceive? Because like, again, I'm an athlete. I exercise. Like I know when my abs are the way I want them to look, or, you know, if my like arms got some, what, you know, like I, those are things I pay attention to, but they're not things I beat myself up over anymore. And, and that was hugely important for my em emotional health. So I'll mm -hmm. let you talk about like the other perspective of it, but as a woman, um, it was, there were de definitely different societal pressures to like be skinny and, or at some point be thick in certain areas. Right. And like, we'll see that on social media all the time and in songs and all kinds of stuff. But, um, that's what, that's what it was for me. Ronnie, can I just plug something real, real Go quick? Ahead. Real, real Go quick. ahead. Yes. Because Savannah touched on it all, but I want to, I want to bullet point it with great clarity for our viewing and listening audience. I think it's important for, for everybody to understand what the aspects of body image are so that they're clear on how to view this from, from an, an intellectual perspective so that they can be more aware of what they need to be paying attention to. So when we're talking about your body image, we're talking about first and foremost, the way you see yourself. So that's perceptual. How are you perceiving your own body? The other thing is the way you feel about the way you look. Clinically, that's what we call affective. Then you have the thoughts and beliefs you feel about your body. That's the cognitive part clinically, right? And then the fourth aspect of body image is the things you do in relation to the way that you look, which is clinically what we call the behavioral component. So I just wanted to highlight that within a clinical context because I think it's really important for our, our audience to understand that conceptually. Ronnie, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and, and thank you, Dr. Piss for sharing that. And, and thank you, Savannah, for answering that question because I think, like I said, from you know, I'm a male. So from the outside looking in, you know, you always hear about all these societal pressures and stigmas and assumptions and, and, and ways that a woman's body is supposed to look, it's supposed to act, it's supposed to do and all these things. And, you know, I always, I always like asking women, especially student, female student athletes, like, you know, how is it like, you know, not only just managing just societal pressures of, you know, what you should look like, what you should wear, what you shouldn't wear and things like that, but also like being a student athlete where, you know, your body is going to look a certain way just because of what you do athletically more than maybe 95% of the female population. So, you know, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and it's really important that people really understand that, you know, your self, your self worth of your body image is more important than what somebody else can, can think of you, which, you know, kind of leads me into, you know, my, you know, my spiel of it where, <clears throat> so I was been big my entire life. Like, well, I'm not going to say fat because I don't want to be negative, but I, I was the fat kid my entire life. I was that kid, you know, I've heard every fat joke you could ever think of. Like I've heard them all. And so, you know, I struggled with obesity my entire life. My mom's side of the family, they are morbidly obese and that's being a nice way to put it. Whereas my dad's side of the family, he was an athlete within his own regard, but majority of his family had all the ailments and things like that, not necessarily, you know, taking care of their bodies. So for me, I always tell people like, my relationship with food has been trash. I'm 28 now. So for the first, I would say 26 and a half years of my life, my relationship with food was just absolutely trash. And, you know, I always tell people that I'm a, a recovering food addict. And because, you know, for me, like I'm an emotional eater. My, my emotions were tied to food. Like if I was happy, oh, I'm gonna eat a good meal or I'm gonna eat a lot. If I was sad, oh, I was definitely eating a lot. You know, if I was nervous, I was eating. If I was sad, I was eating. If I was happy, whatever the case may be, whatever my emotions was, I was typically going to either eat a lot or eat more than what I should have. And I always tell people like my, one of my earliest memories of overeating was I was in third grade, I was eight years old. I never forget it. And Wendy's had just came out with their triple cheeseburger. Kid you not, crushed it. Eight years old, crushed a triple cheeseburger with a large fry and drink. Didn't even bat an eye, never thought nothing about it. So, you know, but I always tell people and, you know, being being morbidly obese and being big for me, there was nothing comfortable about that feeling. There was nothing comfortable about being the biggest person in school. And one of the most humbling times of being a big person is when you walk into a clothing store and, and to your point, you know, like how restaurants. Oh, God, you speak in a restaurant. I can't tell you how many times I'll go in a restaurant and they will have the narrowest chairs in the world, I instantly get pissed off. Cause I'm just like, yo, who do you think is sitting in this little chair? I'd be like, uh, y'all got a chair with no side rails or anything like a bar stool. I sit at a bar stool at this point. But one of the things that 
I was always hyper. I was always hyper vigilant about my weight, and I always tried to figure out what I could do to lose weight. But I was always hustling backwards. Like, and one of the things I learned when I got to college was is you can't out train a bad diet. And for literally, like my, now that I think about it now, of course, you know, there's so many things I would do differently post athletic career. But during my athletic career, I hustled backwards a lot more as far as nutrition and exercising because. As far as working out and things like that, I was a workout warrior. When I got to height, I started seriously lifting weights when I was 14 in the eighth grade. And I started seriously lifting weights and started seriously trying to, you know, transform my body. But I was still eating terribly. Like even through high school, I would eat terribly. And so one of my biggest weight transformations was when I was a sophomore in high school, I had got up to 320 pounds. And so that summer going into my junior year, I was just like, I feel terrible. Like I was wearing size 46 jeans, 4X shirts. Like, you know, if you looked at me, you'd be like, bro, there's no way in the world he's 320 pounds. But because I had muscle un- underneath the fat, it didn't look as bad, but I felt horrible. So that summer I lost, in that summer I lost 60 pounds that entire summer. I just ran the whole summer. Didn't lift no weights. And it just ran the whole summer. And I got all the way down to 260. But what I failed to realize was, is even though I lost all this weight and I did restrict some of my eating, I went right back to eating large amounts again. I always tell people, like, when I had lost all that weight, my metabolism was on, like, you know, on steroids. Like, I could down a large pizza and be hungry 45 minutes later like I didn't have anything to eat. And so literally my entire life, I've always had to struggle with, you know, emotional eating, not eating too much and eating too little. And it wasn't until I became an adult that I really you know, became hyper-focused on like, it's not about the number on the scale. It's about how you feel in your body. And, you know, when I, and, and I, and I want to say that because unfortunately we live in a country where 54% of our country is obese by standard. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, if you ask me, I do feel like, and not to get too far off track, but I do feel like the measurements in which they feel like, you know, because for me, I'm six one. Technically, according to doctors, at 6'1", I'm supposed to be between 160 and 185 pounds. If I was 185 pounds right now, y'all would thought I was sick. I promise you. Like, you would think I was mm-hmm. sick. So I always feel like, you know, those scales and things like that that they try and ingrain in us at an early age are very misleading. And they're not, up, if, if anything, they're just not updated for one. But they're also very misleading because they automatically put this number in your head of what you're supposed to be for your height and, and everything like that. And so... When I when I listen to especially nowadays, you know, when I when I listen to people in the obese community talk about body body positivity and fat shaming and things like that, I completely I completely agree in the sense of you know, look, nobody should be shamed for what they look like and things like that. I always tell people, you know, you don't gain that weight overnight. You know, it's not like I woke up one day and I was just three hundred twenty pounds. It was it was the culmination of every single day making poor choices with my eating and nutrition mm-hmm. that led me to one day looking at the scale and was like damn, I'm 320 pounds. Like the hell did I don't do? Like, you know, so that right there, you know, and we, we see these numbers and we get them fixed in our mind. Like, you know, oh, well, I'm just fat. I'm not going to do anything. And I just double down on it and keep eating more. And the reason I said that, you know, I feel like I was addicted to food for so long is because I feel like food can very well easily be a common addiction and food in some instances can be a substance that can be heavily abused. The only mm-hmm. difference is, is food is the one substance we put in our bodies that we cannot stop putting in our bodies. You know, for people who have alcohol abuse issues, um, opioid abuse issues, you know, all those other, you know, when we think of substance abuse, whether it's gambling, money, whatever the case may be, we always think, oh, well, those issues, you can just kind of, you know, you can work towards, you know, stopping them or going into remission. Well, with food, you can't do that. Food, there is no, oh, well, I'm, you know, when I say I'm a recovering food addict, oh, well, I don't eat food no more. No, what I have learned is how to have a better relationship with food and have more balance. So for me, for example, like, I've eliminated a lot of my unhealthy eating habits. Like I don't eat out as much as I used to. I cook way more from home than I used to and things like that. But will I still go to Burger King and get me a Whopper here and there? Absolutely. You know, I love food. And is it good for you? No, not necessarily. But I have found a way for me to have a balance where like at the end of the day, my important goal is to, you know, be healthy and, you know, be able to do things in an older age for me, my family and everything like that. But also, you know, 
understanding that a lot of the triggers that were associated behind my eating and things like that were things that were happening externally that forced me like, you know, food was comfort for me. And every, you know, everybody has a comfort and everybody has their vices when they're stressed out or they're overwhelmed and things like that. But you can still have a healthy relationship with food and, you know, quote unquote, you know, eat, you know, eat a lot and things like that. You know, I always tell people you can eat a lot of healthy food. Like you could eat a whole bag of salad. That might not even be a hundred calories, but it's a lot of food quantity. It's all about the quantity and the quality of the food that you eat. That's most important. But for a long time, man, I, I had the worst relationship with food ever. And, and it was hard to really come out of that. So for those, for our listeners out there, for those of you who might be struggling with obesity, who might be struggling with, you know, emotional eating and things like that. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, like Savannah said, and like Dr. Pierce said, first and foremost, recognizing that it is a issue or a challenge for you is the first, is the most important part. Because for me, it took me a long time to realize that it was, oh, I'm an emotional eater. Or, oh, eating is my vice for when I'm overwhelmed or stressed out and things like that. I would just associate it with, oh, I'm just hungry or, oh, you know, well, I'm bored. Let me just go eat. It's hard to recognize that in the moment. So I always tell people, finding a relationship with food that works for you, whether that's, you know, like we talked about earlier, your macronutrients and things like that, understanding your body and your body's needs, because everybody's bodies is different. What might work for Savannah is not going to work for me and it's not going to work for Dr. Pitts and vice versa. So building that relationship and understanding like, look, you did not gain that weight overnight. And that's mm-hmm. the for my for the the people who you know are are overweight and things like that for you listen understand this you did not gain the weight over right. and um, it's not disappearing you can't eat healthy for one day you're not dropping 30 pounds overnight and getting back to your ideal weight it takes consistency choosing every single day same we have these same conversations with people who are addicted to other substances waking up and choosing for that day because that is the only day we have promised today is the only day we have promised So in this moment, in this day, the choices I make today, how will they impact me today? I'm not worried about tomorrow. I'm not worried about next week, next month, next year. I need to make choices today that if I do wake up and see tomorrow, I will thank yesterday's self for. Ronnie, I want to I want to jump in because we're we're tight on time um, and I want to make sure that Savannah has the ability to sort of wrap us up and and make this connection. So I want to I want to make this. Um, this public service announcement, if you will, to parents who listen to the show, because I think that it's really important for them to understand um, how body image affects uh, the the athlete. You know, particularly with with high school and, and college athletes, um, it's it is of great concern because body dissatisfaction is one of the most consistent and robust risk factors for eating disorders, as you both have, have touched on indirectly. Um, and it's a significant, significant predictor of low self-esteem, depression, and obesity. So I, I, I want, uh, Savannah, if you will, if you could, we're at 1222. If you could take five minutes to make the connection, and, and I, I want to wrap this up with the connection where women's health is concerned, because as, as we talk about vaginal health and, and the role that women's health has on the mental health and all that, can you just sort of wrap that up for us in, in this next five minutes? And then Ronnie and I will, will close this up, but, but make that connection. Um, please, please, please tell our viewing and listening audience how to get in touch with you, how to support your efforts, how to invest in everything that you're trying to do, because what you're doing is so critically important. And we want to make sure that folks are rallying around you and giving you the support that you need to make this happen, because these services you're providing are so desperately needed. Please. Absolutely. Sure thing. Thank you so much. Um, I want to echo quickly uh, to, to wrap this in or to tie it in. Sorry. So one, Absolutely. What you're saying to parents is so important. Like, please, please support your children in, in, in facilitating their change for their individual choices and for like their improvement. Right. I think Ronnie's story resonates with me so much because everything that he shared is a huge testament to like one's ability to change and to shift right? And it's not so much about like the rules, right? And I just want to stress that for people who are currently struggling with this, it's not about like, I mean, yes, discipline is important, right? We're on an athlete podcast. This is about discipline, right? And about like accountability and making sure that you are paying attention to the things and actively making good choices. And um, 
I want to just focus on the, like the, the aspect of, you know, your body best. For me, I, I did not have the privilege of having a consistent doctor my whole life. Some people have you, if you're with the same person who saw you from when you were a baby, that's amazing. And that's really cool. But like most of us probably aren't right. The only person that, that's been with your body the whole time is you. So there's nothing that somebody else, I mean, you should always like consume and make conscious choices, inform choices, right? Like I'm a scientist. I'm not telling you not to listen to doctor. I, that's not the message at all. Please understand that. All I'm saying is that like, you have to pay attention to what you feel and what you think and what you're putting, putting in. So like, if you have this goal set around like, oh, I have to eat this way or whatever, think about how that's making you feel. Think about what are the active changes that you can identify? Cause that makes the journey so much easier. And I just wanted to say that in respect to tying this into my business and women's health, um, I, with that like personal choice and change uh, a remark that I made I would say like we have an arc of life everybody has an arc of life right so the the, the way you grow and change over time um, necessitates tailored solutions so the same way that you ate or the same way that you took care of yourself the way the way you uh, took care of your skin anything changes over time right like your hormones change your body changes like you may grow you may shrink like all of that is a reality that we face right and sometimes because we're looking at ourselves it's kind of weird like you may see an old photo of yourself or you may look at yourself in the mirror one day and be like oh wait what I remember distinctly laying in bed one day when I'm probably I don't know probably like 15 years old and I'm like how did my legs get this long I'm like I barely fit in my bed anymore you know so it's like those are all things that like remember you you as an individual experience within yourself and so that is kind of like the message behind what I'm trying to do with my business. My business supports women from menstruation through menopause. We essentially are creating a, a retail storefront um, that uh, addresses the various needs that, that your vagina or your uh, reproductive healthcare may need, right? So uh, sometimes that looks like suppositories or organic pads and tampons, it looks really different. But again, that's different culturally, it's different um, depending on your stage of life, it depends if you're sexually active at that time, um, and there is, of course, like body dysmorphia about that too, right? There are like perceptions about like w whatever it is. I mean, we, we can talk about this endlessly, whether it's um, smell, whether it's look, whether it's whatever about your like intimate parts, right? And it's about kind of um, understanding like A, the science behind like what you need um, to make sure that you're not bombarding yourself with, oh, like I think I need to be a particular way or, you know, uh, and, and really just like understanding how your body can be its healthiest. Um, is going to be really important. So again, like you are, you are the person who knows your body best. Like you should always like seek knowledge and go out there and try and find um, new information. And then, you know, like test that against your own gut and your own instincts and your own and and your own um, body's uh, information signaling to you, right? So I, I just wanted to like say that, and that's kind of a cornerstone of like how I approach the, the health conversation. I know we're close on time, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, my, well, I'm again located in New York City, so I, I live in Upper Manhattan right now. Um, I'm looking to launch my, well, I've incorporated my business and we're in the seed fundraising round. Um, we're hoping to get angel investors as well as potentially some venture capital. Um, mm -hmm. Our business structure is not necessarily super palatable to VCs and we understand that, but um, we are going to see if that works. And um, even if I have to bootstrap this, which is how I've been doing it so far, we're, we're going to make it work. And so um, I'm looking to open a retail, a physical storefront soon. And um, you can follow us on social media. You can follow me. My, my at is sav.works. So that's S-A-V dot works, W-O-R-K-S. And um, I, the social media for my business is at, and then it's casa, like C-A-S-A. -S -A, that's house for, in Spanish, dot D-E dot L-A dot L-U-N-A. So it's casa de la luna. And then there's an underscore at the end. Um, and I, of course, it's linked in my bio. So if works is easier, you can follow us there. Um, and again, we'll be launching a website soon, but the best way to kind of stay tuned is, is by following my Instagram and then learning more from there. Again, so grateful for this opportunity and the time. This is a topic that's near and dear to me, um, just like athleticism is. And uh, thank you. Thank you again. This has been awesome. Thank you, Savannah. Ronnie, you were great to say something. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, thank you so much. And, you know, definitely for those who are out there listening, please, please, please mm -hmm. plug in with Savannah on her business, especially if you're a woman. You know, it, it, it's time that we I always say as men, we need to make sure that women have access to all the resources and tools available for them for their bodies, because 
is no business for us as men to be making choices for women on what they should do with their bodies because your bodies are unique in their own ways. You all have superpowers that science just cannot mm -hmm. explain. And mm -hmm. so you need people who are, are doing the good work like you are to raise awareness for you know women's bodies needs, especially in the reproductive area, because mm -hmm. a lot of women of color suffer from things because they do not have enough information or education or awareness about some of the things that they go through with their reproductive organs and things like that, that other cultures might not go through. So shout out to you for doing that. And once again, we really appreciate you coming on the show and spending time with us this morning. All the information and the gems you dropped today are so, so, so very thankful for. And so thank you for taking the time with us. Yeah, I absolutely. love it. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. We are definitely honored. And, and as always, we're going to have you back. <laughs> yes, definitely. definitely. We're, we're definitely going to have you back again. We're going to have Chris back too. He, you know, he couldn't be with us today, but but we want you both. It would be really awesome if you two could come on together. Um, that would be absolutely amazing. Look, folks, you know, as we're wrapping up today, we just want you to, to take heed to the things that we shared with you today. As Ronnie said, we dropped, dropped some serious gems today. And here's the other thing to, that I want you to remember as we're closing out. You have to recognize that the body composition and training required for optimal health and performance are not identical for all athletes. That is, a, that is one of the key takeaways that we want you to have today. Stop trying to box athletes in to this cookie cutter approach to performance enhancement and, and overall wellness, every body is different and you can't have a cookie cutter approach to wellness and performance enhancement. Take these things into consideration. Be diligent and purposeful in um, developing a plan that, that's systemic. It's a systemic plan to put in place to address the challenges that athletes are having when it comes to um, body image and, and body satisfaction and stop making it all about performance because at the end of the day, if they're not right mentally, they're not gonna perform for you the way that you need them to be. That's all we have for today, folks. We hope that you took all of these gems that we share with you and that you're actually applying them to your life. We wanna hear from you. We wanna know that we're making a difference in your life. Savannah, thank you for joining us today. Again, you are more than welcome to join us anytime you want. Um, just thank you, folks. We want you to have an enjoyable rest of your Saturday. Have a great, great weekend. Take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Love yourself. And we'll see you back here same time next Saturday. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.